Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. So they said to him, What can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you may believe in the one that he has sent. So they said to him, What sign can you do, that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, It was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which came, comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise In our first reading from the book of Exodus, the people are complaining. Why? What on earth could they possibly have to be unhappy about? God has just forced Pharaoh to free them from slavery. After the series of plagues the Egyptians had endured, they not only wanted the Jews to leave, they gave them gifts of gold and silver to encourage them to leave. Pharaoh's army then chases them out into the desert with the intention of destroying them. God parts the Red Sea for the Israelites to pass through and then drowns Pharaoh's army. And yet, they barely finish rejoicing over their freedom when they start complaining again. There's no food or water out here. Now, in one sense, we can completely understand the reaction. They're in the desert. It's ungodly hot during the day and unbearably cold at night. It's sandy. It's rocky. And yet, that doesn't justify their reaction because of what they've been through so far. They should have trusted the Lord more at this point. They're complaining to Moses. Why did you lead us out here in the desert to die? Does it really make any sense that God would go through such lengths to free them from slavery in Egypt just to have them starve to death in the desert? Well, of course not. Every time God sends them a little test of faith, they fail dismally. And it begs the question, why do they keep complaining. What is their problem? Now look carefully at the first sentence of this first reading. The whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Note that. It does not say they were complaining about God per se. Rather, Moses and Aaron. That's why the Israelites keep complaining and rebelling. They don't see that it's God leading them, guiding them, protecting them. They think this is Moses' doing. And it's easy to rebel against another human being. And the Lord keeps trying to get this message through to them. I'm running the show here, not Moses. He's just my instrument. And they will continually miss it. Later in the story, when the people are complaining about something else, Moses will turn to the Lord and say, I just don't know what to do with these people. Please just let me die. And the Lord will answer him, don't despair. Because it's not you they have the problem with, it's me. This will happen again later in scripture in the book of Samuel. The people approach the prophet Samuel and say, appoint a king to rule over us. Samuel answers them, we already have a king. God is our king. And the people complain, no, we want a king that we can see so we can be like the other nations. Samuel answers them, we're not supposed to be like the other nations. God established us precisely to be different from the other nations. The people insist, appoint a king, we want to be like the other nations. And Samuel's distraught over this, and God says to Samuel almost the exact same thing he says to Moses. Don't despair, 
because it's not you they are rejecting, it's me they reject. As Jesus is ascending into heaven, one of the last things he says to his apostles is, whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever receives you, receives me. But whoever rejects you, rejects me. God reiterates this point all throughout scripture, that to reject the church he has established is the same as rejecting him. Because he's really the one guiding the church through the people he's chosen to lead it. Granted, sometimes those people have been flawed. Many in history were downright despicable. And those people have to answer for their sins like anyone. But it doesn't change the fact that God is ultimately in control of his church. The same is as true today as it was in the days of Moses and Samuel. But only people with faith can see that. Others will always see the church as nothing more than a human institution. I get lots of people come in for sponsor certificates to be godparents or confirmation sponsors, and our records indicate they don't come to church. So I make an appointment with them and question them about this, and often I get an answer like, well, Father, I'm spiritual but not religious. Translation, I pray but I don't go to church. Lots of young people say things like, I don't believe in institutionalized religion. Well, since all religions are institutionalized, you don't believe in religion then. Even cults are institutionalized. This, though, has to be my personal favorite. I believe in Jesus, but not the church. I believe Jesus never intended to establish a church. And I respond, then clearly you haven't read the scriptures because that's all over the New Testament. You literally can't get away from it. I had one woman challenge me on that. And she said, yeah, but who wrote the Bible? The church. So of course they added that Jesus said these things so they could gain power. I answered her, okay, you admit that Jesus is God and that the church wrote the Bible. And both of those things are true. But if Jesus is God, by definition, he's all-knowing, loving, and powerful. How then could he allow his church to hijack his authority and lie about it for the sake of gaining power for 2,000 years and not do anything about it? Either he doesn't care about the deception, in which case he's not all loving, or he can't stop the deception, in which case he's not all loving or all powerful. In either case, Jesus can't be God, so how can you say that you believe in him? Furthermore, if Jesus isn't God, how do you explain all the miracles that have taken place in history through the saints who all believed and stood behind the authority of the church in Jesus' name, as well as the endless works of charity that have taken place through the ministry of the church, despite the fact that all the empires in history have attempted to destroy the church? Word of caution. Before you take this reasoning with people, you will get one of two reactions. Either, wow, I never thought of it that way, or kaboom. And more often than not, it's the latter, not the former. Just giving you a heads up on that. People who say these things all boil down to one common denominator. I want to do what I want to do without anybody telling me it's wrong. Period. That's what it comes down to. So how do we prevent ourselves from falling into this trap? Know how, note how it begins with the Israelites. Complaining. The whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Today's gospel is a continuation of last week's, where Jesus multiplied the loaves of bread and fish to feed the crowd of thousands. Today, this same crowd pursues Jesus and questions him about how to please God. As soon as Jesus tells them, believe in the one that he has sent, they respond, well, okay, show us a sign that we can believe in you. Our fathers ate manna in the desert. What can you do? Now, keep in mind, Jesus has just multiplied five barley loaves and a couple of fish to feed all of them with 12 baskets of leftovers, as if that wasn't sign enough. They wanted to crown Jesus king over that. Suddenly, it's not good enough anymore. But Jesus uses this as a springboard to start talking about the bread of life the Eucharist. And next week, pay attention to it, we'll see the same crowd start to grumble and complain about Jesus. And because of that, because they can't stop thinking with their bellies, just as the Israelites of the first reading, they miss that Jesus is offering them something far, far better.
Complaining, my brothers and sisters, is rooted in the sin of pride. Because complaining assumes I deserve more than what I have been given, or I deserve to be treated better than I have been. I want to repeat that. Complaining, my brothers and sisters, is rooted in the sin of pride. Because complaining assumes I deserve more than what I have been given, or deserve to be treated better than I have been. This problem has grown tremendously over the past 40 years with the internet. Now, the internet has been a wonderful tool of communication and sharing ideas, but the dark side of the internet is that it has made us crave what others have. So how do we protect ourselves from jealousy, envy, want, desire, which all stem into complaining? Don't just be content with what God has given you. Be thankful for what God has given you. Be grateful for what God has made in you. Giving God thanks for his many blessings is something we should do every day. And I don't care how tough you think your life is, we all have something we can thank God for. As I said last week, one of the major roots of sin is the fear that I'm missing out on something that others have. Resist the temptation of comparing yourself to others. Resist the temptation to measure your worth by what you perceive others are worth. You are a gift just the way you are. Love that gift. Appreciate that gift. You have been given blessings that others don't have. Be grateful for those blessings. The negativity that comes with complaining will block with what God is trying to do with you. It will rob you of peace and will ultimately be the door that ushers you into bigger and better sins. So be grateful. Give thanks. And be at peace with who you are and what you have. And blessed be God forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.